go and pull the. We're live. Up. We are live. I see in the top Pop right. <laughs> All right, you should do it. We'll see if the group chat pop up. Somebody can confirm. There it is. Yeah, yeah it it started. We are live. I see in the top right. Good, good. I see it now. I just got to go to my actual channel because yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. So we'll we'll figure it out. For anyone who's already popped in, thanks for stopping in. We'll get this show up and running in a few minutes. Hopefully less than that. Here we go. Prepper trifecta. Now I can mute this and see the chat. There we go, everybody. How you doing? This is once again the Prepper Trifecta. It's myself, the Lord Humongous, the ruler of the wasteland, the Ayatollah of Rock and Rolla. We got JJ Johnson from the plains of the Midwest and Shay from the frozen Northwoods of Canada. So how are you guys doing, everybody? Today we're talking about the 10 sanitation considerations for Shay Hit the Fan. If you guys have comments, we'll deal with questions after we go over briefly what we talked about in our videos. So you guys want to start it off? What do you think about this topic this time? Yeah, I do. I want to jump right in. I like your intro better than uh, JJ's. He's more yeah. <laughs> you like everything a about Eric. A little bit of pomp and circumstance. <laughs> Confidence. It was, it was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm my, my energy out after failing with, with simple technology for about 20 minutes. <laughs> well, it wasn't too bad. We're only, what, like five minutes off? So Yeah, barely. Uh, it's all Work good. the crowd up into a good frenzy. This was this one was tough. They're, they all seem to be tough. I, I can never get like one, two, three, like ten. Yeah, let's do something easy this time. <laughs> yeah, right. Like one through three. I always I always find myself thinking about it for a day or two to get that, that right. Idea. But, you know, like just like all the other ones, it's like we're using different language, but we're all overlapping in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You guys touched more on the uh, the sewage part, which I didn't tap, tap dance on. I think it may be indicative of where we live, too, because I know that with Eric, it was like water, water, water. We're using water. Didn't really talk right. about that. And I, I don't know what you call those medical rooms, but we both used our own language, me and Eric, anyways, to describe right. the, uh, you know, a place for the people being sick. And I was talking Some about sort of here. infirmary or quarantine situation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, that's we both in a roundabout way. We're talking about the exact same thing. Right. Which was yeah. neat. I had that on my on my list at the end for I, I kind of saw that as more of a pandemic situation, you know what I mean, right. as opposed to general sanitation. But I think it, it's all definitely applicable. Yeah, in my mind, I thought of like even a situation where someone had something like the flu, you know, they're probably not going to die or whatever. But if you have five, or six people, 10, 15 people in your group, you don't want five or six people to come down with the flu. That could be disastrous. So trying to keep them a little bit separate would be pretty helpful. Ex yeah, exactly. And that's why those isolation rooms are, are really, really important. Um, I like JJ was the one that brought up the check valve with the sewer system, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Which, yeah. You know, that was a good, that's a good solution. The problem is I'm in a rental, so I don't know how feasible it is to install a backflow preventer like that. But it's definitely would, at least out there. You would hope that if you're uh, – well, it, it, in some areas it's required by code. So yeah, I'll have to check. There might already be yeah, one. It kind of just depends. Um, and then hopefully in apartment complexes, <laughs> hopefully they have them because if not, people in apartment complexes are going to be hosed. I mean, it's going to be bad. So I would say the exception oh. being with the apartment complex, if you're higher up, the pressure might get let out, flooding everyone else's rooms on the lower Yeah, level. yeah. So you're just living over a sewer as opposed <laughs> right. to you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For uh, the audience just joining us, they're – um, unfamiliar with the check valve concept with the sewage system. Maybe JJ, you can elaborate on, on what, what you sure. mean by the check valve. So, so essentially what it is, is it's just a valve. It's a one way valve so that the sewage can come out of your house and it's, it's like a little swing, you know, basically and it'll swing open and the stuff goes out. But when stuff tries to come back in, the valve stops it from, from coming back into your house. And so if you, if you don't have one of those installed in your home, you might consider, you know, having one installed. Um, and and if you don't have the money or you can't do that or whatever, then at least know where the sewer shutoff valve is. Because if you if you don't have a, a check valve, you should have just a straight regular valve that you can close. So it should be one of the two, hopefully. If you've got nothing there, then you really, really should look at having one of the two put in. Okay, with the obvious concept or the, the logic that it's everything's going to back back uh push to the persons right up the right up the hoses so to speak which and, is interesting and the, and the reason just a little bit so everybody understands the reason that that backs up 
is if the if the utility the water the water's down and the sewer processing plant is down then they're not going to be getting water into the sewage plant so that's all that s solids are going to solidify in there and it's going to start backing up in the pipes and so it may take several days or several weeks before that backs up to where you live depending on how far you are you know from the the waste facility or whatever but eventually it will you know and then and then it's going to be just a big mess yeah, and I've seen articles lately about all the uh, like fatbergs they call them that have been clogging up sewers because of supposedly flushable wipes and things like grease tend to coagulate in these big blobs that they have to go in there and basically like pressure wash them out. So uh, it would uh, it could you know if someone's not out there cleaning that stuff up, that could happen even faster. Well, I don't think anybody's going to be cleaning that up when SHTF happens. That's for sure. <laughs> no, I guess no, no way. Yeah. I really like – go for it. Who's in? I was just going to say a couple other things I had were bodies I think could be an issue, unfortunately, and some way to recycle. Like what I was talking about before, if you're in an area with a tremendous amount of water, you don't have to worry about uh, reusing any kind of wastewater. But where it's more of a uh, resource, you might want to think about collecting things that aren't – not like sewage water, but you know, if you wash dishes with it or you took a shower, you can use that water for other things too. Mm hmm yeah, for flushing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, if, water if, if plans, still, yeah and if you have a septic system, you're going to be, you know, a, a lot better off than most people because you can continue to use any of that water for flushing your toilet pretty much, you know. Yeah, and JJ, and, I thought it was an important thing that you mentioned in your video about the limits of the septic systems that people don't normally have to think about because they're usually not approaching the, uh, the limits of the two right. people per room, but, you know, yeah. it might be if you have other people there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we got a lot of folks watching already. How many? How many? There's a bunch of people in the yeah, chat. 36, 36 viewers as of right now. Very cool. You can see the chat, JJ. I am. I got. I pulled it up just so I can. I can see it. And see if we get any questions. Try to put it. Yeah, Caleb Fox says you got to be careful with the sewers due to the giant mutated alligators. <laughs> how can I hate to get off track here? How can you guys see the chat and I can't see the chat? I just literally opened it like I'm a viewer on my channel. Like I just went to. Oh YouTube. right. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And then in the upper right hand corner, there's a little three little line little dots. Click that and hit pop out chat, and then you can just set it over here so you can see it. Because okay. the video is slightly yeah. like behind a little bit, actually. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think we had we didn't have any that conflicted. I don't think, which I don't think really in any of these have we had any that were you know actually opposite of each other. We don't always necessarily cover the exact same things, but I think we have yet to have any real kind of disagreements. So, have either one of you guys ever tried any composting toilets? Sure. I have not used them, but. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on them, Jay? Because I've never used them. I've seen them and and looked into them, but I haven't I haven't ever had one and, and used it. What my concern my concern with those is it seems like capacity may be a little bit of an issue. But I don't I don't know if you had six or eight people in a group, could you use just one? It depends how big the hole is. That's the biggest thing, and it also depends on. Oh no, uh, I'm talking I'm talking about a, a commercial made compost composting toilet. Well. My experience with the smaller trailer ones and the, the few systems I've seen off grid, it's more about uh, what you use to break down materials. Mm -hmm. So if it's going to be sawdust, I think Eric mentioned that, but another one that's right. peat uh, moss or sawdust or uh, coffee grinds is another good one. Um, breaking down the material and actually rotating it and moving it around on a regular basis. So I've never made one personally. I've seen them, I've played with them, a few different off grid locations, uh, even ones for trailers as well. They work. You just have to sort of be on top of them, and they don't smell as bad as people may think. But as long yeah, as, I don't they, think like, as, long as they, you have the pee separate from the poop, right? Isn't that kind of a key with those? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a key. And if anything, you want to just put the poop in it and not the pee. Yeah, actually, my girlfriend went on a trip with some uh, some sort of like pre wedding thing, and they went to some cabin recently, and they had one of those commercial composting toilets. And she said capacity, because there was like five or six people there, was a big issue. Like there was way too many people for it. So Leonard Davis uh, says, "Hey guys, what's your opinion on the best salt to store?" He says he he does Celtic sea salt. So. I would say that you want to store two kinds of salt, generally speaking, for prepping. One is iodized salt for seasoning your food and that kind of stuff. And the second one is uh, kosher salt or canning salt. 
for packing, you know, preserving meats and different things like that. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? I agree. I don't think, I mean, you can use either of those for um, like food, correct? There's nothing about the kosher salt that would prevent you from using a it seasoning. It's just like coarser yeah. grains and whatnot. Right. It's the other way around. You don't want to use the iodized salt to, to pack meat and stuff. Right. Like but that. you can you use like the, salt pork or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, unless you have like water softeners or something that you need the uh, salt for that, you know, the, the things you can get from Walmart are going to serve your purposes for most of the things that you need to, uh, to do. Yeah, and I'm not, and I'm and like pink Himalayan salt is pretty pretty good, but you know for but that's pretty expensive. You know, it's kind of a it's a clicky, kind of uh, trendy thing right now. The pink right. Himalayan, but like a special <laughs> lamp, a special lamp made out of Himalayan salt. Yeah, but it's, I will uh, say that all the salt is incredibly um, useful, and you you obviously need it if you're not doing something like canning or preserving. You're probably not going to need an entire crap ton of it. You know, like having a five or 10 pounds of it would probably last most people for an incredibly long time. If you're not going to be doing those other things, if you are, you might need a ton of it. So you, you know, gotta find I, out exactly what your plan is. It's funny. I did a video um, not too long ago on like, I don't know, top 25 things to stock up at Sam's club or whatever. And in the comments, everybody is just, comment after comment of you forgot salt you forgot <laughs> salt you forgot this, how salt is worth more than gold and everybody's freaking out and everything and i'm like okay i i mean i understand salt's important and you definitely want to have a good a good stock on hand but you know we're probably not going to be doing um salt pork like you know like using salt to preserve meat all that much i'm probably going to smoke it a whole right. lot more than i'm going to than i'm going to salt it um I don't, I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, how much? Yeah, do you I think, think I agree. I think if you're getting canned foods, processed foods, you know, the long-term stored food, any normal stuff, you're going to be getting tons of or plenty of salt for dietary reasons. You know, if you want to have a, have a little bit extra for seasoning, cooking, things like that, that's fine. But like I just said, if you if you think you're going to be needing like 50, 100 pounds, that's only if you have a specific reason for it. So if you do, go for it. If not, it's not something that you're necessarily going to. When was the last time you used five pounds of salt without doing any of that? Yeah, sorry. I had to get this chat window worked out here. I don't, I'm not familiar with too many differentials with respect to salt in terms of uh, food preservation anyways. Definitely stay away from anything that has got any sort of uh, fragrance on it. That's just out of the question. Um, besides that, I'd probably lean towards more the primitive skills. So salting, curing, smoking, drying, using the sun. But it, obviously, we've got electricity. We use more modern methods of food preservation, pressure canning. I use an actual dehydrator, things of that nature. Salting, for anybody that wishes to know, it's it's all about inhibiting the growth of bacteria. So when you put salt on meat or you rub it, it, it sort of binds things in and, and bacteria growth can't get in there uh, because of the lack of moisture and lack of lack of uh, oxygen capacity to get in. So I, I, to be honest, that's a pretty technical question. Celtic sea salt as opposed to XYZ sea salt, in my opinion, I've done a lot of pressure canning, a lot of food preservation. I can't think of many... I think we're talking in like decimal level differences here. If it's we're talking pure salts. Yeah. Yeah. I think in an emergency situation, you're going to be able to do it regardless of what type of salt you have. But sure. um, yeah, you might notice little bits of difference, but like I said, if it's, if, you, if that's your plan, then figure out how much you need, how much you're planning on doing this preservation and stock that much. If you're just generally storing food and you're not really going to need that much salt just for, you know, health and nutrition and for seasoning. You're just, it's probably more important to have other types of varied seasonings than just salt, in my opinion. So Lady T suggests getting a feed store salt. And I, and I suppose that's probably fine. You probably just need to make sure that it's uh, filtered or, or sifted out or whatever. Make sure you don't have any rocks and stuff like that. Like a lot of times when you get stuff at feed stores, you'll have excess crap in there. It's not as, as finely processed and whatnot. But... I don't know. I haven't ever bought any salt at a feed store, so I, I could be wrong on that. I would just keep that in mind, maybe. Right. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. That's probably that's usually the case with animal grade stuff. Is it's usually right. pretty much the same. There's just less quality restrictions on it. One thing I I would like to add is, so if we've got salting meats or, or or smoking meat or whatever. It's in my opinion, it's important to embrace all the different aspects of pressure canning is uh, an example in addition to saltine or dehydrate or something like that because there's advantages and disadvantages to all the different systems so pressure canning is an example this is something that it's heavy it's fragile it's glass not very practical but anything you put in there theoretically you can open the can and eat it right away right out of the bag not so much necessarily with 
a dehydration. It's edible, yes, but palatable, different story. So if you're thinking about food preservation in general, go through the whole spectrum, modern techniques and um, the, the, the bushcraft primitive skill techniques as well. Good point. Good point. Yep, I agree. So Iron Man Spartan, uh, I don't know why I'm reading questions. This is your, it's yeah. your show, Eric. You, yeah, you know. no <laughs> for the most Sorry. part, we'll do our best job to see your questions, but if you want to make sure we see it for sure, do the super chat and that should guarantee that we see it. But yes, yeah, so we have a couple here that said, if you're homesteading, keep lots of salt, agricultural food storage requires salt. Yeah, it depends. Like I said, it depends on your plan. There's some things that other people would never use and you might use tons of it all depends on what you're going to be doing and you need to try and figure that out so you can tell what kind of kinds of things you need to store more of because someone who's in an apartment or is going to be bugging out to a spot in the wilderness like they're not taking 200 pounds of salt with them this is not going to happen there's just no reason for that but if you're on a homestead and you're going to be preserving all this wild game that you're shooting yeah you might need hundreds of a whole pallet of it it all depends I think we're getting a little off topic here. What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> we're talking <laughs> about <laughs> annotation was, was, was the topic, but I, yeah, that's okay. Right. Yeah, when it comes back to the sanitation considerations, the um, three things that I came down with for waste removal, because that's a big one if you're not if you don't have a big property, is burn, bury, or biodegrade, which I mentioned in my video, which that pretty much takes care of any type of waste disposal. And you can use multiples of them. And in my case, I'm counting flushing as berry if you still have the option for flushing. But like we mentioned, that's something that might disappear at a moment's notice. Quite catastrophically, if all of a sudden you might be flushing normally, then the next day there's sewage spewing out of your toilet. So I might be inclined, if it's a really serious shit the fan event, to just go ahead and turn off the, um, the drain like you mentioned and just move your alternate methods right away and not have to risk having your house flooded Yep, for sure. And I, I think building a, I think for most people, like for, for suburban suburbia, you know, the, the, probably the majority of people that, that are watching and all that kind of stuff live in some sort of a neighborhood somewhere or something. And, um, and, and even in more rural areas, a lot of people have those outhouse buildings or not outhouse building, but like a shed, like a garage, uh, like a, I can't talk today, like a lawnmower shed, yeah, like a backyard, shed. you know, and, and you can turn that into an outhouse just like that, man. I mean, you know, put it on some skids so you can move it, cut a hole in it, build a little bench, boom. And you just got, all you got to do is dig a, a slit trench in the, you know, the middle of it where it's at and, and you fill it in as you go. And you can just literally just slide it across your yard as you know, the months pass by and, and you would probably be fine for the most part. With the composting aspect as well. One idea I had not to get too off track here, um, <clears throat> was to have some sort of auger system to help mix in your sawdust or help mix in your coffee grounds to, to facilitate uh, helping the process along. So even one of those up here, we've got ice. So do a lot of ice fishing. I've got my ice auger here. To have some sort of system like that where you could literally churn everything over maybe once a week mm -hmm. with respect to a composting system. So another thing I mentioned too is it's almost like a social um, – socially stigmatize people by putting the hand wash station outside of wherever your washing facility is. First off, it's like, number one, you're going to the wash here as a group. We're all going to the washroom here. And, and we can all see you if you're doing it or not. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. It'll be glass or plastic, <laughs> plastic windows. Make sure you're wiping your ass and everything. No. That'll all be enclosed, but then the wash station will be immediately outside. So everybody can make sure, you know, I don't know. No, I mean, hand washing hand washing is uh, extremely important i mean that's uh, that's probably the number going to be the number one vector for carrying disease and and all that kind of thing you know so um i think it's it's hugely important and just you know simple things like having some soap stocked up have, having some bar soap and stuff like that um you know or or knowing how to make it if you want to make it I, although i will say um if you've ever made lye soap before it's really I mean, I've made it anyway out in the woods and it's not great soap. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think stocking it up is definitely a better option there. Do you make it really cheap? My guess would be like, a, it's like a hardwood. So you get your lye solution from hardwood ash. Um, how'd you make it? So we did it with uh, goat fat and uh, rendered goat fat and lye. And lye, lye from hardwood. You can get lye from hardwood ash, but yeah. Cool. 
and and um, that was about it. I don't think there was much else in there. It was been 15, 20 years ago, so I, I may I may be overlooking something, but uh, it pretty much smelled like goat. <laughs> I bet you could do it with if it's just the fat content, uh, like deer fat, any sort of wild animal, and then hardwood, any sort of hardwood, you burn it down to uh, to an ash, and then you cycle the water through it. Um, to get your lye solution, L-Y-E, your highly alkaline solution. Uh, that'd be interesting. That's, I mean, you did it with, uh, with human fat and Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> Something to consider. Body disposal and a good soap together. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that's funny. So we had Barry right. Dependent says, can he snort Celtic or smoke Celtic sea salt like bath salts? You do you, man. <laughs> no rules. I, the apocalypse. We should see a video on that bear. Yeah, that, or, that, would be, that would be that would be good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Ravenfile says use tallow, and there's almost no smell. So I don't know. Like I said, we were using it was just rendered goat fat that we were using, and and it, and it wasn't it wasn't great at all. Um, but you know, we we may have done it wrong too. I mean, I I was just going off of the instructions that were you know provided by our our instructor who was teaching us how to do it and he may have, he may have not know how to do it right. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a skill that would be useful to have the knowledge, but soap is so cheap right now that unless you're really going to be into doing a lot of the homesteading type stuff like that, it's, I would definitely, either way I would grab a couple packs of <laughs> bars of soap. Or a well, if you're going to practice now, right? Like that's kind of the main point. If you're going to, if you are going to rely on that practice now, so you can get your recipe figured out, and, and actually know it, you know? Um, yeah. Exactly. That's a, that's a, you know, that's a perfect example of a, of a, a divide with preparedness individuals out there that I see all the time, which is there's the long-term and there's the immediate. So there's the people that just purchase things. So people may think, so I'll oh, just buy soap, you know, as opposed to exploring and entertaining the idea of making soap. But that's a little bit of a, a that's, really far-fetched like none of us have made well jj's made soap i haven't made soap yet but a, a more practical example would be food you know people think i need food buy food that's it no it's you know entertaining growing food it's entertaining learning how to fish learning how to hunt learning how to do all these other sorts of things for long term because it's a, it's a whole uh you got to have a whole system is what I've always said is it, it has to be, you got to think gardening, you got to think trapping, hunting, scavenging, bartering, stocking it up. You know, you gotta, you gotta think about all the different aspects of it. And then, you know, do you know anything about trapping? Do you have traps? Do you know how to set them? And cause I'm telling you, man, like, just one, like of the, one of the disparities in the survival community is, uh, you know, everybody, there's this bleed over between survival and bushcraft and, and prepping and everything right and and the bushcraft crowd likes to think that you know making all these traps and going out and setting them out and all that kind of stuff is uh is well it's it's possible but it's extraordinarily time consuming and and it's and it's very difficult to get just right and and they're not as effective as modern traps like in in that instance to me you're way better off having some traps ahead of time some cable you know simple loop snares and 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 regular um like foothold traps and stuff like that because those are so much more effective than primitive made traps for the most part you can get primitive made traps to work well but you got to spend a lot of time doing it and that's not something that you're going to have a lot of in my my thought anyway yeah, I agree. I think that there's this is a common theme with all this stuff is there's like an old school way to do it that you could do, even if all you have is the, you know, the woods in your knife. And then there's modern ways that make this incredibly easy. And I think the winning formula is to know how to do the old timey ways and to practice it at least some of the time, but then have those modern technological uh, you know advancements at your disposal to really get better results unless something happens and you can't use them. There you go. Nail in the coffin, Eric. Exactly what I was going to say. That's just it. Because you don't know if you're going to be in a situation where you're in the woods and maybe you got, you know, jumped by five people and you lost all your possessions and all you have is the very basic necessities. So understanding that, you know, maybe moss grows on certain, uh, uh, the west side or, or the, looking at the stars for navigation because you don't have your compass, things of this accord are going to be extremely important. 
including right. primitive trapping, making cordage from milkweed, as an example, right? Right, like just because you want to be able to, you know, walk 15 miles or something, but it doesn't mean you're not going to use your car until it breaks or something, or or you want to know how to use a bow drill, but I'm not going to do that if I have I still have a lighter in my pack, things like that. I think we talked about this at the last the last uh, event or well trifecta, which was the whole bug out, and we talked. I think we touched on geostashing briefly, and, and my going along that thought process, my. My logic was, well, if you really wanted to practice bugging out, you see all these CC DMC preppers like, okay, kids, we're gonna bug out. It's like every every episode, okay, we're gonna bug out. You know, after they do the tour of the place and they all jump in the jeep and they, you know, drive and you know they got their guns blazing. And I just think that's just a crock of shit. If you really wanted to challenge yourself to bug out in a realistic scenario, I, I would almost think if you like were taking this extremely serious, you would have to do it like on foot with an injury. To go from your, you know, if your bug out location is 100 miles away, then every X, Y, Z miles you've got your geostash here, and you're injured, right? Maybe you're using a crutch. That would, you know, if you can, if you can pass that test, then you, anything with respect to a bug out is going to be peaches and cream. Yeah, some somehow make it more difficult. Like if your bug out bag is, you know, 50 pounds, see how far you can get with an 80 pound pack or something like that. And, you know, just maybe cut off a finger, like a, like or something like that. Just a, just a little, maybe a yeah. pinky or something, just to make it a little harder. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. hardcore right there. <laughs> Take a gut shot with like one of those puny little calibers, like three eighty or something, and then see how far you can make it. Yeah, so, no, do the finger, and then your buddies put in a little ice pack, and you know they take it hundred miles up north, and you got to get there within a certain time to get your finger sewn back on. But hey, Wasn't that a movie, a, a movie on Netflix where the guy got his Johnson chopped off? Mm, I think he's going to Pornhub. No, <laughs> yeah. no it's, called, it's called The Package. It's on Netflix. Okay. That is I, don't, I don't know what you're watching, Eric. That's not my uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> moving right along. So, so I'm going to jump have. in on a question. The survivalist farmer says, uh, What's the best way to store soap for long term? I, I'm for me, I just put bar soap in my closet. I don't do anything special with it. Um, like I get bars of like dial soap or whatever, or dove soap or, you know, whatever I can find cheap. And I just put it in the closet. I don't think you have to do anything particularly, you know, no, I mean, most soap should be pretty shelf stable unless it's going to be somewhere that's incredibly hot. You might have some issues if it you know, literally starts getting sticky or melting or whatever, or very, very humid might maybe, but yeah, there's nothing about it that would degrade as far as I know for basic soap. Yeah, can't think of anything else either. And, and with the overlap with food preservation in terms of soap, now I mean some sort of fat content in it. Fats are usually the the component within a food uh, within food that goes rancid. Um, but personally, I just I can't see a bar of soap going bad after five or ten years. If you're really concerned, look at what affects fats or foods with food preservation: light, oxygen, humidity, temperature. Uh, Characteristics like that. So vacuum and see if you got a big mylar bag and vacuum sealed your soap room temperature, you know, I I would put the money on red that it would be fine after twenty years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I think mylar is even overkill, but yeah, it would probably be totally like commercial yeah, modern exactly. commercial soaps are probably even less likely to have issues because they're not gonna be made with actual, you know, animal fat. Yep. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it says liquid soap needs to be for, Yeah, I've seen that some of the like hand sanitizer and stuff, you might get a little separation or it becomes watery, but uh, you can just store just pure isopropyl and things like that if you're worried about it for sanitation. Yeah, because that's pretty much all it is, is gelled alcohol. Right. Or, yeah, yeah, it's just a congealing powder. agent so that you can use it more easily. Yep. What's the difference between hand warmers, oxygen absorbers, and desiccants? Well, the hand warmers, as far as I know, they are just like pure iron. The, the oxidation process will absorb, like creates heat and absorb moisture. And desiccants are just pure silicate or silica, if I'm not mistaken. And you can reuse those. The hand warmers, you can't reuse. So the so this, this desiccate, though, they're just to pull moisture out of the air. They are they're, just to they're not they pulling don't, They don't create oxygen. any heat. And the oxygen absorbers just the block them. They don't necessarily do any warming or any drying. So those are the difference. Yeah, so uh, a uh, the oxygen absorbers will put off a little bit of moisture too, as okay. well. Um, in there, when they're when they get activated, when they start doing it, you, if you put them in like a Ziploc bag after you open them, you can kind of see that it starts to to condensate and stuff like that. 
So you'll get a tiny bit of moisture, but it's not usually enough to make any huge difference. If, right. if you're doing it in salt or sugar or something, you may have a little hard clump around it or whatever, but it's not any big deal. You just break it up. And it's always, that's always a good idea to throw some desiccants in there as well. If you're doing food storage, you do the O2 absorbers and the um, desiccants. I, some people have said they use the hand warmers, but in my from what I've bought in the past, like that's more expensive than just getting the- That's uh, what I thought. I've heard people say that and I've never understood that because the, the O2 absorbers you can get for 35 to 50 cents, you know, depending right. on the size, you can even get smaller ones, you can get, get cheaper than that. But for like a 3000 CC one, you can get right. it for like 50 cents. So that and would I'm not be- I'm not aware of exactly yeah. how much like, the, uh, the price of them. I was thinking more in terms of understanding how much CC a hand warmer gives off. So you can say, buy how, much is really a, how much is the hand absorber really absorbing in terms of exactly. CC? I, That's I what they, exactly, exactly. So you can be like, well, I'll just get the hand warmer and put that in the Mylar bag and seal that in the bucket, right? And, Right. Sure, all of us have played the Mylar game, um, but you don't know. You don't know. But you know, if you do get into the, the the whole oxygen absorber, buying them in bulk, take them and separate them into smaller quantities and seal them real quick because you don't want to be opening up that big bag of O2 absorbers over and over and over again uh, yep. as you're storing food throughout the, the months. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lady, <laughs> Lady T says, for sanitation, a purpose should consider both child and adult diapers. What would you do? <laughs> I would not use the diaper unless I actually had to. <laughs> I think she's joking. She's got to be kidding about that, right? <laughs> well, unless you actually have, you know, that age children, then of course that's, an, that's a consideration. Well, yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I would and, and at least some cloth, cloth diapers. Diaper. Yeah. So cloth, cloth diapers are pretty useful, like baby cloth diapers, because you can use them for rags. You can, use, you know, and they're real absorbent and all that. But I'm not, I'm not wearing diapers. I'm sorry. Well, I, I don't know what part of the country she's from, but uh, she, she is not joking. But I don't know. Maybe if there's three of you and you got to pull a 12-hour guard duty shift, you know, do what you got to do. No, I get somebody to come replace me. I heard a story. I heard a story about a guy, a, a former uh, military guy in. In, in it was, it was tell there's the story where you couldn't break formations, this big thing, and he was part of some sort of special operation. Or they're doing this drill going back and forth, and the guy literally shit his pants. And, <laughs> and to, for the sake of not breaking formation going through the drill, he's like, Okay, I'm just gonna let it go, right? And you can see shit coming out of his pants. Private so man, I, what are you gonna do? Well, I, I've been uh, I was rereading uh, on combat with uh, David Grossman. You know, in there he talks about that. There's basically 50% of, of surveyed soldiers say they pissed themselves in combat and 25% of them admit to shitting themselves. So, you know, the numbers are higher than that, right? I mean, because a lot of people aren't going to admit to it. So, it, I mean, in, in combat type situations, it happens way more frequently than you would imagine. I don't know. Knowing those infantry guys, they'll probably say they shit their pants when they really have it. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I mean, if you're talking about someone being totally, because she, she said that if you read up, they were talking about the specific situation where you were, uh, someone was unconscious or injured, then, you know, that might make sense if, if you're not going to drag them outside every time to go, but if you're cleaning up shit one way or the other, you know, so. Okay, well, practically, realistically, medical application, sure, because if somebody's unconscious right, right now, we, we do something for their uh, digestive, uh, you know, we've got catheters and things like that for, for um Disposal, a little bit of a dirty topic, but with you know, I guess there would have to be consideration in that respect from a medical perspective. Somebody's unconscious; you don't want to just lay them in the bed; and they're going to shit themselves or over the course of a week, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, Colorado yeah. biker, uh, Colorado biker prepper says a diaper is useful if you have to go stealth and use a ghillie suit, and snipers use them all the time. Now, I don't know about all the time, but I do remember in the Carlos Hathcock book he talked about uh, basically crapping in his suit because he couldn't you know he's basically like 100 yards from the enemy so it's a pretty you're unique situation though you're hardcore when you're packing diapers in your tactical kit man yeah, That's exactly. what I'm, saying. That's what I'm, saying. I'm not i'm not down on it i'm not saying don't do it i think it could could be a realistic thing if, you, if you're getting that hardcore but holy that's, shit. One, that's one way to live your life yes i hate to jump in here i know it's eric's show go for it there's a gentleman that said uh what do you all think about werewolf preppers and I don't know werewolf, but we're talking about hygiene here. So maybe we should stick on that topic. 
Do you guys want to give your two cents on that, or do you want to just say? Well, I'd be curious to know. He, he's he's got a good channel, and he's he's a pretty square way dude. Bear is. I would okay. I would be curious to know what you mean by werewolf preppers. I, I'm not exactly familiar with the term, so I don't I don't know what he means. Um, but it might yeah, be, it might be good something specific. I'm not aware of the term. Me neither. I thought it was a YouTube channel. Watch them. Stick, the, stick it, it in the comments. It could be a channel named Werewolf Preppers. Or is it people literally prepping to kill werewolves? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. So you hopefully, can, he'll, hopefully he'll throw in an explanation in here. Yeah, I'll, if you can come. Um, yeah, that's their defense technique. They're going to go up and fight everybody when shit is... Yeah. I'm assuming <laughs> it's talking about like only come out like at certain times. Like they only, they're only only going to... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Because the full moon thing? Oh, like they no, come out... No, no. Once a month, that's it. Yeah, I don't you know. Up there, I don't, JJ. I don't know. <laughs> if that's what they're talking about, if that means preppers who are going to hide away for, until one day a month or whatever, then we've talked about how that's not really a feasible plan. Yeah. Not, no, not one day a month. Only when there's a full moon. Right. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. So I'm not sure what he's talking about. Lady yeah. T's a little upset with this. She says we're going to get smacked. Because <laughs> of the diaper thing? Yeah, yeah. Someone, Mr. SHTF man says, how deep to dig a privy? So if you've got your hole, how deep should you try to dig that thing? Guys? So, you, I mean, you really want to go as deep as you can, right? So if, if, if in the context of what our videos were talking about, it was, it was a, you know, a nationwide collapse and you're, you're looking at long-term sanitation, you really want to go as deep as you can. Uh, the, only, the only factor with, as far as depth is, is you really don't want to get into the water table because then that's going to make it smell worse. Um, so as long as you're above the water table, as go as low as you can or as deep as you can. But I would say a minimum of two to three feet, you know, just because that's going to give you uh, some some time in that place, in that location. You know, it's going to take a little while to fill it up. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say Colorado Prepper said the same thing. As deep as you can without hitting the water table, deeper would be better. Also, the or the diameter of the hole is going to make a difference too because if it's a really narrow like a post hole diggers that's going to fill up pretty quick depends on how many people you have but i think your goal should be somewhere between two to six feet you know any deeper than that would not normally necessary unless you have a ton of people or it's real the ground is really not porous at all you know and the water would collect and take a long time to drain so but yes yeah, so a few several feet should usually be enough so Kansy says a sheep, a sheep dog, or a werewolf. I think maybe he's thinking that uh, what Bear was talking about was like basically uh, oh, like the dark preppers, like a yeah, yeah, dark kind dark. of the, the, like the dark prepper mindset, like Che had talked about, guys who are going to be taking advantage of other preppers and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Did you guys okay. want to talk about that a little bit? Or, sure. I mean, yeah, well, you have the whole you have a whole kind of series on it, don't you, Che? I see the whole relevance with hygiene there. What, are they going to steal our toilet paper? What's the, uh, what's the relevance? Diapers? Nobody steals my diapers. I think it's just a general question. You know, it doesn't have to be all on topic. I mean, we can we can talk about whatever. All right, for JJ's sake, I'm gonna I'm gonna chill for a bit here and, and entertain the question. What's the question exactly? So I think he's just saying, what do you think about uh, those preppers who have dark intentions? Those those preppers who are going to you know take advantage of other people or you know, whatever the case may be, uh, you know, the Crazy. criminals essentially who are, who are preppers. I see them. You guys, you guys see these comments on your channels. Oh, I'm going to, you know, shoot the people down the road and take all your supplies. I know you guys have seen comments like this. Oh yeah. Unfortunately they're out there. These are the, the insecure, not very confident uh, individuals sitting in the basement that are, you know, don't get laid on a regular basis. Uh, that are just waiting. They want SHTF to happen. They they they're like waiting for it to happen because they have this uh, in their minds. They have this ideology that they're going to be in control. They're going to be a, of status. Um, if you would come across somebody like that, and if, if there was a real SHTF, or I'm talking at the level where law enforcement isn't is going in Walmart and stealing things, you got to take those people out. The unfortunate reality. What do I think? What do I think? Of those people they're out there they do exist you got to take them out there's there's where there's a lack of morals and ethics with respect to an individual that prepares uh if shit were to hit the fan those people need to be erased quickly not to say that i'm actively going to do anything like that but i it wouldn't put it past me if i was doing any sort of reconnaissance or 
resource acquisition mission to, to come across somebody like that to do what I needed to do, so to speak. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I Eric? agree. I'd say it basically comes down to game theory. When you have a, a plan and you inject the so-called sinners into the mix or the Hawks and the, versus the Doves, whatever you want to call it, the you only need one or two of them to be in the system to throw everything into disarray. So you have to um, be planning and expecting there to be people who are just going to do everything to maximize their own survivability, their own you know personal utility, whatever you want to call it, and take advantage of everyone else and be willing to do pretty much anything to maximize that and plan accordingly. And I agree. I mean, you have they could be incredibly dangerous if they're at all competent preppers and they have that sort of sociopathic or psychopathic personality traits. So you've got to be really be ready to uh, deal with that. Uh, now, here, 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 specify like, what we said. Some people only prep weapons with the intention of taking everything else they would need, thus to turn werewolf prepper. We have no plans for such, just making y'all aware. Okay, so if you're talking about someone who is exclusively talking prepping weapons and no food or water, I'm not quite as worried about them. They're going to flip out and be very dangerous within the first few weeks, but they're going to die almost as quickly as everyone else because, you know, they might ha they'll have the ability to cause a lot of problems in the short term. But if they literally don't have any food or water, luckily they'll probably not last quite as long. But you've got, I mean, a, a threat is a threat, and they would certainly be something to consider. So I did a, I did a video a while back saying that basically looters die first. And, um, and, and the, the idea here is, is that what people like to fantasize about is going out, you know, these, these werewolf preppers, like you're talking about, uh, Bear, they're like, they're going to go out and they're going to just go from house to house and they're going to take, you know, everything and then they'll move on to the next place and then they'll, they'll take everything. The, the problem with that is, is in reality, we have a hundred million gun owners in this country and you don't have any idea, you know, what, uh, what home you're walking into and the old lady with the 357 in your, in her, in her dress or in her nightgown is going to be the guy that's going to put you down. You know, the more engagements that you're involved with when it comes to armed conflict, the higher statistically your chances are that you're going to die. And so those people are going to kill themselves off first. Or, or other people will kill them. <laughs> but yeah. the more engagements that they get involved with, the higher likelihood they're going to get killed off. And so I don't think that there'll be a problem long term. Um, you may have some especially savvy ones, you know, with military training and those kinds of things who are going to be a little bit more difficult to deal with. Um, but as a general rule, I, I don't really think they're going to be a big problem because I think they're going to get taken out fairly, fairly rapidly. Personal. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say the same thing when it comes down to, like you said, putting yourself in these risky situations. And even if you if you have a group of five or six people busting in on some one person, you know, you're going to that person's going to die. But one of your people may die every time, too. And when uh, even if your success rate is fairly high, you know, 90 percent, that still means one out of every 10 times you're going to have some sort of catastrophic wound or or something. So it's something that I don't necessarily see the need to take them as a threat a lot differently than just the fact that there's going to be other, you know, gang members or whatever who have guns and now don't have any food. I think the much more severe risk would be people who are competent and aren't necessarily are better at planning, but still are, you know, the antisocial personality disorders or the psychopathy and things like that, that you won't necessarily know right off the bat or kind of wait for their chance to screw you over. I disagree with both of you. <laughs> oh yeah. Which part? Yeah. Yeah. Do your thing. No, that's all. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm like, not, not, not completely. I, I think you guys may be giving these the the aspect of them dying off or disappearing quickly. Um, I think we got to give them more credit because I know of certain individuals that definitely have some training and the, the psychology of of fitting the. It, it's almost like there are criminals in waiting because there's no doubt. If SHTF criminals are going to go house to house and house, as, as JJ suggested, but some are going to be successful. And it's sure. almost like these werewolf, if we followed our friend's interpret, uh, definition here correctly, they're they're the same, they're the, the exact same thing, but they're it's like they're waiting for SHTF and then they're going to become criminals. And they already, if they're smart, I know some of them out there are, they're probably scoping out specific locations to hit and they've got everything timed down and they know they know where to go with shtf and they know how to take people out um 
I think I'm a little bit more cautious or leery of individuals like that. And I think some of them will be very successful if SHTF. And it's unfortunate. And that's their game plan. And it, in, in some ways, maybe they're smarter than us, you know, completely unethical, completely immoral. But maybe they're smart. Maybe that's all you got to do. Stockpile a bunch of weapons, find out where a handful of really hardcore preppers live, live and carefully calculate how to take them out. And if that's, if you can just focus everything on that, then you're you're above the game because you open the, the, the golden door to all the resources, right? So I, I hate to hate to crash the party here, but I'm no, just, no, 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 I agree with the concept. I think what we what me and JJ were specifically referring to is well like the idea that there's a group of like there's a large group of people out there. Most of them are not preppers who when things you know when she hits the fan will resort to crime or take it from other people. And I think our point was that we're not necessarily have any reason to treat them differently than that. Like someone who and then the people who are just sitting in their basement waiting for she hit the fan are maybe a little off enough that they might actually be less competent in most situations. But in general, my point was not that they won't be a concern, but that I don't see any reason to treat them differently than any of the other people who, when she hits the fan, will become predatory. Okay. Sure, fair. And maybe I'll, I'll just take 20 seconds to clarify one thing um, with in, in terms of uh, rationalizing my perspective is I've met a lot of preppers over the years with my network and whatnot and taught in conventions and whatever, a lot of ex-military. And some of these guys, I've got to, you know, events all the time and some of these guys are fucking like excuse my language but they are like freak shows there's a good two or three percent where there's something off with them you know i'm talking about meeting people in person uh preparedness individuals and going through classes and teaching and whatnot and there's there's a small minority that there's something definitely off and they have an ulterior motive uh, which could be in alignment with what we're discussing here so I think in, as a, a general rule, I, I remember hearing somewhere that there's about one in every thousand people are psychopaths or sociopaths. And and so you know, that element's out there, right? That that those groups of people are out there and, and they're definitely going to be problematic. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, they're, a, they're already a small segment of society who are willing to do that. Then you include you know, starvation and dehydration and the fact that they're not trained on water purification and, and sanitation and spreading disease and those kinds of things. And, and so when you, when you factor out all the survival issues that are, they're going to be having to fight against, and then you factor out the armed confrontations that they're getting in, you know, you're, you're really weaning that number down to a, a pretty small segment of society. So, Will they be a problem? Yeah, I think they definitely will be a problem for some people, but for society at large, I just don't think they're going to be the problem that people think they are. You know, and, well, and, heard, and part of the I've reason, I, part of the reason I, I talk about that is, is that like when you look at third world countries and stuff, um, you'll see those psychopaths raised to you know uh, positions of warlords and all those kinds of things. But as a general rule, they're not a a menace on society everywhere. You know, they, they do pop their heads up here and there in third world countries, but you, you don't see them being a, a, a huge problem. And so I always try to think of, you know, a th what a third world country would look like here in the States. And, and that's where I'm kind of drawing my associations, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, I've heard that the number for sociopathic um, and psychopaths to me is high as 3%, not one out of a thousand. But regardless, I think the bigger issue is people who are just going to be willing to be incredibly selfish and incredibly violent when they are out of resources, when they feel like their life is in danger, things like that. You don't necessarily have to have a psychopathic personality disorder to kill everyone around you and take their food, you know, if you think that you're going to die. And that, that could be a huge portion of the population, you know, that could be most people you come across if the situation is serious enough. So that's the big concern in my mind. Mm -hmm. Two points. Des desperation in general. Sure. And, and to feed on that lineage of thought with, with, with what Eric said is that people that are rational, civil, you know, let's say hi to you when you give them, uh, you know, your $5 for the Starbucks coffee or whatever, whatever it is throughout the day uh, could potentially become savages psychologically if they're starving for food. Um, I think the long, the short of it, if I were to summarize this quick area of discussion quickly is I did a video on this a long time ago, but security is such a huge component 
And people like us, I don't think we have anything to worry about because we sort of live and breathe this, you know, the preparedness um, mindset, if you will, for lack of a better term or phrase. So security is very important to us. We're all firearms guys. It's obvious. We are. We want to take care of what we have around us, our family, our friends, the well-being of uh, self-sustainability, the safety and safety and security of our own well-being. So we don't have to worry, but other people may have to. There's one. There was one episode on Doomsday Preppers where this lady just she was a gardener or something like that. Maybe you guys can recall it, and she just wasn't into security. She it, she said or firearms. She said something to the effect of like, oh, it doesn't suit who I am or it doesn't suit, you know, who I am as a person, something of that accord. And she, it's wonderful gardens and growing tomatoes and blah, 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 blah. I'm thinking that's great. You're self-sustainable long term, but you're neglecting a huge aspect of preparedness, which is being able to defend yourself, you know. And when the marauders come or an individual like this comes and kills your husband and does something very inappropriate to you, you might have a different view on security. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. So Definitely. I think, I think like you're saying, like we all coming from the mindset of assuming that we're going to have to deal with armed people trying to take our stuff at some point. So the idea of someone who's specifically planning to do that ahead of time doesn't necessarily change anything for us. Right. Good point. Actually, that's actually a really good point. It, 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 Assuming somebody's going to do that ahead of time, it doesn't matter because we're all... Right. Did they have the gun before it hit the fan or did they get it after? I mean, it doesn't really matter that much. You're still going to put a gun to their face. It doesn't matter. Exactly. Right. I will say, if you are any of those people out there who may be not planning to kill everyone, but if you think, oh, I've got some guns, I can scrounge up some food. Guns are expensive. Instead of buying your next $1,000 gun, just put a few hundred dollars into some water and food storage and you won't be forced <laughs> to do this because there's a lot of situations... Yeah. <laughs> where it's not going to be the world. It might just be a month or two, like Puerto Rico or something. And when are you going to go to around killing people in Puerto Rico and taking their stuff when the entire rest of the country is fine and you know you only need the last two or three weeks? Like, give me a break. Just get some food and water. It's not that hard. That's a perfect way. Perfect way to wrap that up right there. That's so. <laughs> spot on. So Kansi asked, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read his question. I think we missed it. He said, uh, when when you run out of soap for body cleaning, what natural soap cleaning materials will you use often or recommend? You guys want to hit that? Anybody? I can, I can say a couple things on it. Yeah, go for it. So the, the one that pops into my head is cattail root. Um, cattail root, if you, um, you pull it out and you grab it, it's kind of a big stocky, starchy root. And you can uh, take that and dice it up or chop it up into small pieces and put it in with water. And you can kind of get it to suds up a little bit. It has a uh, sopamine in it naturally. And um, that will work for like a mild kind of soap. You know, um, the other thing that I've heard people talk about, I've never done is um, like a pine needle tea sort of making like an antiseptic kind of wash that you could you could use as well. And you'd probably want to thin that down pretty thin. I wouldn't I wouldn't think that you would want it very strong because otherwise it's it's probably going to be kind of nasty. But um, those are the two things that I'm that I'm aware of right off the top of my head. But that's I've never given a lot of thought. Natural soaps, pine needle tea is to drink. Good vitamin C. Cattails are excellent to eat, uh, especially the baby ones, the young ones. They taste fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. But an actual soap, wild edible off yeah. the top. I'm pretty sure all, all parts of the cat tail are edible at different stages. You know, yes. I mean, there's nothing poison in there. It's a, one of the globally found edible plants. It's kind of like a survival superstore, you know? <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of, a lot of them up here. I can't think of, like, I don't know off the top of my head what you can use as a soup. Yeah, I'm not, honestly not familiar with a whole lot of natural alternatives. I also am, like I said, I live in the desert. There's not very many plants in, you know, to speak of. I'd say I would probably just have to resort to using, you know, boil up some water, make it nice and hot, and uh, just go that route, scrub clean like that, and not actually have too many chemical um, things to add to it. So I could get my friend. I'm going to give her a plug, if you don't mind. It's ediblewildfood.com, or it's wildediblefood.com, one of the two. Okay. Uh, I was going to try and bring up her site here. It's one of the two, Edible Wild Food or Wild Edible. And uh, her name's Karen Stevenson. She's the, the foremost authority on, on wild edibles. 
oh, in cool. Canada anyways. Just the, the other thing you can do um, for bathing just in general is, uh, is just sunbathing actually will also help. Um, you can go out, just lay out naked, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, let the ultraviolet rays kind of, you know, kill off any, any uh, skin bacteria and mold and fungus and all that kind of stuff. That's actually fairly helpful to do too if you're uh, in a uh, really wet and tropical kind of environment and that kind of thing, um, then that, that is effective. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much all that I've got. Uh, so, some, so far we've covered wearing diapers and nude sunbathing. So what's next? There you go. <laughs> I mean, it helps you metabolize your vitamin D too, right? You there you know? go. Everybody needs the D. Yeah. So, Candy said something about there being a cedar wash. I'm not really familiar with cedar wash. Is that? Is say that something about that. Cedar is mm -hmm. actually for. Um, yeah. Colorado bike prepper says you can use yucca root. Yeah, yucca root is the same. That's that's also another one that's just like cattail root. That's right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so there are options. You uh, have to scope out your area and see if there's something you could actually get ahead of time. Cool. I'm sure that's available. Yeah, you got yeah, you got yucca root out by you for sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You with uh, with yucca too. It's pretty cool because you can uh, you can take the the spines on that and and make a needle and thread. You just cut the little the little needle part around like three quarters of the way around it, and then go down at the bottom the base of it and cut the back back part of it and you can pull the thread right out right out of the plant and have a needle and thread ready to go it's actually it's, i made a pair of shoes like that in the desert i've seen a video of that it's pretty interesting looking at you just cut the, like basically split around the skin and then the, the kind of yeah. pithy strings come out with it it's pretty badass actually i, I was i was really I, I thought that was just super cool when i saw that in training but that was neat we don't have that here in Canada. I know when you described the JJ, I was like, okay, I know what you're talking about now because I've seen that before. So, Kansi asks charcoal and water for scrubbing and cleaning. Um, I know that you can use charcoal and water for like brushing teeth and stuff like that. So, it, it probably would work. I'd, I've just never done it. You would make sure that you want to avoid the ash and only use the charcoal. You know what I'm saying? I, I would imagine if you're going to do that. Um, because the ash can be kind of alkaline and, and would probably end up burning you some and that kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, I also know that silver has mildly like uh, antibacterial properties. So you could Scrooge McDuck it in your uh, silver stash, see if that helps. <laughs> I was going to suggest, and because I wasn't too sure, I, I, I didn't want to say anything live, but I was going to suggest charcoal for sure. You could use charcoal. Yeah. But I wasn't absolutely certain that ash will burn you. I actually have uh, a buddy of mine that was burnt through through hardwood ash because if if it's a hardwood, if you burn a hardwood down, as we discussed earlier, mm -hmm. with uh, the soap making solution, it'll burn your skin because it's highly alkaline. Yeah, and it's actually a component of biodiesel too, uh, which you can derive from a natural source. So yeah, absolutely avoid the ashes if you can uh, if you're burning hardwood. Yeah, but yeah, mm -hmm. charcoal. I, I was thinking for some like in my readings in the past or whatever, the book here or there was like charcoal, charcoal, cleanliness, hygiene. It was something was clicking there, but I didn't want to put it out there and miss, you know, give any misinformation. So there must be some, must be something there. Yeah, and I think another important aspect is I mean, skin is a pretty good natural barrier to these things as long as you maintain good hygiene principles and, and uh, behaviors. And that's the important thing is to make sure. You're not touching your mouth and your eyes and your face when you're doing things with your hands, covering up any exposed wounds, things like that are going to be more important, I think, than getting literally getting just physical dirt off your skin for the most part. Obviously, you want to do that, but having good hygiene practices are going to be what really saves well, you. And, and just jumping into a lake or a stream or whatever and just cleaning off is fine. You know, I mean, that you don't necessarily have to have soap, you know, I mean. Uh, we we like it and, it and it's more effective and all that kind of thing. But uh, I'm I think I went 21 days without without using soap and I was I was fine. I was a little stinky, but you know yeah. you just open the creek and and clean off, do the best you can, and you know you're fine. So exactly, yeah. There's definitely like I said, definitely just staying clean and making sure you don't do anything. Because most of the, I think for most people, the other than the diseases that crop up just because of general lack of sanitation in the overall area, it's gonna, the problems that people have are gonna be from 
you know, touching things and then touching their food or their mouth or their eyes, things like that, or getting an infected wound. Not just from being dirty overall. Yeah. You, like, I don't even see that being, it would almost be less of an issue post SHTF because we all go to work somewhere, we do, we interact with people, we do the one to one, shaking hands, opening doors, office buildings, and things like that. And it's almost like that would disappear if SHTF. So your exposure to potential diseases, bacteria, viruses would, would go smaller if you were to bug out to your location. So we're talking about this whole washing thing uh, with, with soaps and whatnot. What are we really talking about? It's basically we all have bacteria on our skin. If we let that go, the bacteria gets wild and it's like a party at some sort of billionaire's house in Los Angeles. We can't let it go that far. So it's almost like this, this game we have to play. We have to scrub off the bacteria every once in a while off our skin to make sure it doesn't get too crazy. And it's, it's important to focus on the crucial areas, which would be, you know, where the sun doesn't shine. Cracks and crevices, yeah. Armpits. Isn't that, isn't that everywhere in Canada? You guys got sun up there? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're, you're right. Your, your, your exposure is probably definitely going to go down to different people. I think you will probably be more dirty, though, just because – you're, you're working, you know, you're, you're outside getting water and trapping and hunting. And, you know, you're you, a lot of people nowadays sit in the office all day and, and don't really get that dirty per se. Yes. Know? Yes. And no, I, I agree and I disagree yeah. because you're interacting with any number of different dynamics or matrices of people that have touched any yeah. number of different things where if you're in the wild or in the wilderness, you're touching more natural elements you know, right. I guess there's an argument to be said if, you know, you're interacting with the environment where there's, you know, coyote poop or, or any number, of, if you're setting up traps where you, you've got uh, deer scats, maybe that got on your skin, but the argument could go either way because. Yeah. yeah I think what, what JJ's saying is that there's a difference, a difference between being like physically dirty and being actually contaminated. Like yeah. if you're working on your homestead or you're in the woods and you grab a pine branch, you might get sap all over your hand and be sticky and gross, but you're not necessarily going to be any more uh, unhygienic than if you touch the handle at Buffalo Wild Wings in the bathroom and get all sorts of foul stuff on your hand. It doesn't look dirty, but you're actually more at risk than you are just getting covered with pine sap in the woods. Yeah. So uh, you guys got any thoughts on saunas? Caleb, I have very that, little experience with saunas, saunas, so I can't really speak on that. Jay? Okay. Um, I know you've made them. I know you've made them out there, sweat lodges, little peyote, little, you know. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I get did. crazy. <laughs> then, the, then the sauna. Uh, hot rock, water, dripping, heated rock, uh, more open the pores, cleansing. And, you know, it's just a, it, it basically a different way of cleansing your skin is all it is. A lot more relaxing because the the humidity in the air and the hot atmosphere well, and um, you know, if before you, you do that, you got to have a you got to have a, a small encapsulated area that will hold in the the, the heat and the and the steam and everything, right? I mean, that isn't that kind of step one. It sure is. So what I used was my ice huts, and okay. I had a, a wood stove, and I had a hot rock on the wood stove, and I heated the shit out of it, and we just put a drop. I, I regulated hot water that was connected to a, the flue, the actual stove pipe. It's pretty crazy. It was wrapped around the flue of the stovepipe, so the water got super hot. Water was already really hot, and I regulated how much came, that came out, and it would drop on this rock, and it would turn into steam instantaneously. And it was beautiful. You just sit there and you sweat. And, you know, from a, from a psychological perspective, forget hygiene. It's going to open up your pores and relax things, and the bacteria in your body is going to – some of it's just going to be like, blah and go away it's gonna clean your body up um but from a psychological perspective wow and if you can do that post shtf even and i think that's why i do things like the hot tub and that's why i want to you know make a generator from water and a treadmill motor because it's it, i don't want to just like do the survival thing i i want to like enjoy life when shit hits the fans so it, it, that's largely in part of what it can do for you psychologically, you know, because I would be in a really, really awesome state if I had my team of whatever amount of people around my camp and 
we could say, okay, here's your half an hour. Go to the sauna. Feed it, you know, give it some hardwood, give it some oak or whatever. And uh, you've got your half an hour, 20 minutes to relax. Psychologically, it would be really uh, rejuvenating, I would say. Yeah, you'd have to get one of those uh, Greek things called a strigil that they used to like scrape the sweat off themselves in the sauna. So they would take some dirt so off with that. Have, too. Hey, did you have your fire inside of yours? Is that, or you had a, like a heater or something? What were you heating up the, the rocks with and whatnot? Oh, mine? Yeah, no, it was a wood stove. Okay. Wood stove rocks right on top of the wood stove. Okay. Right on top. We did and it. The way I did it is we had a, we basically made a wiki up with okay. with uh, saplings and and then t and then covered in in uh, in plastic you know with like this queen or whatever and then made a little door and we dug a, a pit down in it and lined that with plastic and then put a bunch of water in it and then we would we had a fire outside and and we were heating up rocks around the fire and then we bring the rocks in and put them in the water to start you know it would boil it and make the steam and everything like that and it would kind of trap it in there and then you just add rocks and add water and keep the two going. And it was, it was fun, man. It was, especially in the winter time. It was kind of cool. It's kind that's of how the natives do it. They heat the rocks and they bring it into a, to water and it steams out. That's, that's the traditional way of doing it. And, uh, you know, it, it, along the short of it, you know, there's probably a handful of different ways you can do it. If it works, it works. And, you know, hygienically, probably a very, very, uh, good thing for you, but, but more important psychologically. And I'm sure you guys would agree that psychology is, is, uh, to the important aspect of survival. That's really interesting. So you dug, go through that one more time. So you had the rock, you heated the rocks outside on a fire. Yeah. So we had a fire outside and had rocks around it. We put them in there and cover them, you know, get them all nice and superheated and whatnot. And then we would bring them in and then put them down in the, in the little, the little hole that we dug, maybe eight to okay. 12 inches okay. deep. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's lined with plastic also. And then there's water inside of it. And then you just put the rocks down in the water and it when the steam yes. up, you know, yes. that's it. That's it. Cool. It's also it's just as a side, it's another way that you can purify water. If you don't oh, have exactly. a container, exactly. you know, yeah. um, you yeah, basically it at that point. So it would definitely work. Mm -hmm. I want to go into a sauna right now for some reason. <laughs> hey, Doug uh, Larrabee asked, can you guys talk about homemade something? And I don't know. I don't know. Lose. Lose. I don't know what that is. Can you clarify, Doug, um, in the comments, and maybe we can talk about it. In the meantime, Justin Miles writes, "Why not just use a solar shower? Works even in some cold temps." I mean, that's certainly good for heating up water. The conversation started originally with alternatives for soap, but yeah, the solar sh the solar showers work fine. I've seen people make versions with PVC pipes, make sort of like a radiator design out of it. You can set that out and all the and paint them black. And uh, those work, even those little camp bags that have black on one side, those can work if you have the sun shining. That'll heat what up. Were you, what were you talking about? I missed it. I was looking at the chat. What's up? Solar showers and oh, heating okay. water with solar showers. That definitely works if you have the the uh, equipment for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially in the southern climates or a little further south where it gets really warm. I mean, you can you can have just a 55 gallon, black 55 gallon drum and, right. and heat it up, and that'll, that'll heat it up close to enough where it's pretty darn comfortable you know yeah like here in the summer if you used any sort of actual solar heater thing it would be too hot very quickly yeah you would melt those bags if you set them outside here in the summer <laughs> you probably would <laughs> and those aren't bad like those are I, I talked about that briefly they were you know those work pretty good for like a, a bug out kind of option they don't weigh a lot you can roll it up throw it in your pack and and that'll help you be able to have some sanitation more long term if you're going if your plan is is to bug out um it's certainly better than jumping in a cold creek <laughs> and it gives you a secondary method to carry extra water that you might come across too you absolutely. have this bag in there absolutely and it's because it's hard the, the thing is is when you're in a, in a in a bug out situation in the, in the woods you know most people don't have a pot bigger than one or two liters usually like unless you've pre-positioned it absolutely you know, and so heating up a lot of water to, to do a bath is, is not very easy to do, you know. And so having those, some of those options and like a solar thing is, is actually a pretty good, pretty good deal. I agree. While you're looking for that question, there's, there's one product. I think it's called Helix where it's a shower system. And what it does is, I'm just going to Google it, but maybe one of our, our visitors uh, can, can confirm this. But it's basically like a, like a, 
shower system that you can use your foot with. You can pump up and create pressure. So, you know, it's not gravity fed. Most of these systems, or even with, with uh, water filtration as well, it's, it's gravity fed and it takes forever to go through. Um, but this one, you use your foot and you just pound it over and over and over. Yeah, the, the rinse, that's called the rinse kit. This one right. starts with each. Well, maybe there's one with called the rinse kit yeah. as well. Uh, but there's one that's specifically that night portable, lightweight, blah, 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 that is designed to create pressure in your container, we'll say five liters, maybe 10 liters, that uh, you can just do the rinse thing. What's great about that is you can get sort of everywhere with it. Um, I was actually, that's one of those products I'm debating on getting in the future. I'm gonna so Google I it. Have, I have one that is, it's not super lightweight. It's a, it looks like an old fashioned fire hide or fire extinguisher. It's a, it's a big stainless steel tank with a pump on the top and, um, and it has a release valve on it and it's got a stand and a propane burner underneath it. So you can hook a propane bottle to it and it'll heat it up. Or you could you could probably also set the, the actual thing over a fire uh, if you hung it right. And then it, it heats it up to temperature, it'll release that, that uh, release valve and it's got a little thermometer thing on the side. And then you just pressurize it and you know do your shower thing. Okay. It's kind of cool, it's, that was from Zodi. I think its name is called Zodi. Yeah. A couple shower. people have jumped on the bandwagon. I, I did find it. It's called a Helio. Uh, that's the company that I remember. And same concept. You, you pump it up and you've got a pressurized system here. Release valve. And you, you, you go through and you do what you have to do. Um, but definitely when it, it comes back to heating up the water, you got solar. There's some companies too that offer simple uh, coil system. You throw that over the fire, which acts as a heat exchange. Goes in. Don't doesn't need power because if we're talking about convection it just hot water will naturally want to raise similar with the uh, the hot tub concept that i've created in the past you don't need electricity to do this necessarily so that's right. yeah that's something i actually mentioned specifically in my video was trying to come up with a way to have not necessarily running water but like you mentioned with the foot pump or those hand washing stations where you can foot pump and you know so you can use both hands without having to try and pour water on, do things like shaving and brushing your teeth, makes it a hell of a lot easier to have some pseudo running water, even if it's just a small amount, a little squirt every time you hit that foot pump, it definitely makes a difference. So who was it that said it? Uh, Carly Hill said you can use your camelback. Yeah, you can use your camelback. You can lay it out on the sun, lay it out on a trash bag or something so it gets a dark surface behind it. You can heat that up and you can use that. It's not a lot. Usually three liters is you're just going to pretty much get wet, soap up, and then rinse off, and that's you know that's about the extent of it. Uh, you're not going to enjoy it too long, but it's effective for sure. So, did you guys see Kansi's question, Eric? Do you want to read that or which one? Uh, mold. Yeah, it says, it says uh, how do you deal with mold? Yeah, and your sleeping gear and clothing from moist temperatures. I mean, the, the most you have to try and keep it as dry as possible. If you're in a superhuman environment, you can try to use some kind of like bleach wipe or nothing, not necessarily bleach, but something that'll kill the mold, but just wiping it down, airing it out is the most important thing and not rolling up your gear when it's still damp and uh, then stashing it away because that's when it gets really rank and mildew and things like that. Yeah, so at, at night, like a lot of times, you know, you'll build up condensation and stuff in your tent just from breathing and, and all that kind of stuff. And it'll drip down and in the morning when you wake up your sleeping bag, just for those who aren't aware of what he's asking, it'll, your sleeping bag will be pretty moist and all that kind of thing. What I always do is I always just pull it out and I lay it out in the sun. I open it up and lay it out in the sun, lay it across like a 550 line, you know, truck or hitched across between two trees. And, and that way that the sun is, you know, getting that and I'll kind of rotate it around and everything. So it gets all the sides of it and it'll be nice and dry and warm. And then once it's dry, then I'll take it back in the tent, you know, and I usually keep it rolled up until I'm ready to sleep on it again. Um, but yeah, that's, I think this using the sun is the is the biggest thing there and trying to keep your gear uh, from getting wet in the first place. Exactly. Like a, like a tea light candle will give off roughly about the same amount of BTU as a human. There's small camping devices you can get that encapsulate a tea light candle that you can put at the top of your tent to help dissipate the moisture out of mm. out of your enclosure. If it's a bivy sack or whatever it is, just like That's a little the, candle lantern kind of thing, like a tea light lantern. Well, no, it's well, yes, yes, the the lantern part. And uh, maybe in the next chat, I'll I'll bring it out here so you guys can see it. 
It's just, it's safe, I guess is what I'm trying to say, so you can hang it up somewhere. And don't worry about this candle burning out for, uh, you know, well, I guess they, generally they, they, they burn for about three hours. So that burns out and that'll help dissipate the moisture somewhat. Another, another key trick is to always open up a couple inches, two or three inches, your, the top of your bivy sack or whatever it is, to allow that escape of moisture, which is a big problem uh, in, in, in more colder temperatures because we're humans, we're all going to be somewhere within the same degrees internally. And the colder, the contrast up north, there's much, there's a lot more moisture. I've woken up, I slept in, you know, minus 30, minus 40 in my bivy. And like there's an ice shield on the inside of my uh, my bivy sack. It's really important to have that little, um, there, an escape window to allow the moisture to, to go through with whatever enclosure that you're in. Even with your your sleep everywhere, like your sleeping bag and then your baby sack, everything, the whole thing. Very good. Indeed. Yeah, it's a, it can be a big problem, especially back when I was in Florida and the air is just so humid. It's not actually always possible to just hang something up to dry. It could take hours or it may never actually get dry. So just having a method of either you know, wiping it down with a, with some sort of cloth or something, trying to deal with it. There's not always a perfect solution for this stuff. You just got to do the best that you can. You know what? I, I hate to jump back in here for a second, but I got to uh, compliment JJ there too. That's that's what you do too, because there'd be a layer of moisture on top of my wiggies or a layer of moisture wherever, a layer of moisture. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You go out hunting for the day or whatever it is you're doing, you take all your gear out, you put your ridge line up, you hang all your gear up, and you let the sun and the air take care of it. So that's yeah. that's exactly what we were saying. That's just part of the practice. Yeah. So Doug asked, uh, I got to clarify the question. He said, how long will jerky last uh, in a vacuum sealed pack? So a long time, a, a long time. If it's properly dried and you don't have a lot of fat content and moisture content in it, and it's, and it's actually fully dehydrated, um, uh, years i would imagine I, I don't i don't know exactly because i've never timed it but it would it would last a long time i mean i was gonna say if it, assuming it's actually jerky and not something like a slim jim or something like yeah. that that um that was it, it is a preservation method i mean that's why they came up with jerking meat to begin with so and, and assuming it's also in a vacuum sealed pack with a desiccant and everything in there i would just give it at least years i don't know if it would last 15 years but i have no problem saying they would last at least five or six years well pemmican pemmican will last almost indefinitely if it's made correctly now that that is different from jerky um it's, it's a little different thing and you got some different chemistry going on there but um if you're looking for a long-term solution for meat then pemmican is probably one of the most time-tested and you know ways to go i would say correct yeah there's plenty of uh, videos out there on YouTube of people making that if you want to check it out. Yeah, I mean, basically, you just dehydrate the meat, and then you you grind it up into to where it's in a, a powder, and then you mix it with uh, lard, and, like, some people will put blueberries and stuff like that in, and then they mix that up and then let it solidify into bars, and, and that's pretty much yeah, it. Yeah, that was always curious to me because we all know that pemmican lasts forever, but then people always say, that, oh, if something has fat in it, it can't store because it'll go rancid so it doesn't necessarily seem to be the case always yeah if it's if it's rendered if it's rendered uh lard basically pure rendered fat then it seems to to last a bit. i don't know i mean that's 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 what they used to say anyway that that uh um, one one of the techniques they used to use was to actually put a layer of fat over top of what you, what whatever it was that you're preserving so with pemmican specifically uh, which I've made. Okay, you're, pot, you're talking about like potted meats, like you're talking about like potted meats, where they oh. would put the, the fat over it in the jar to seal it. Right, right. In in yeah. in, in lieu or in absence of uh, it, basically like a primitive. Think of it like a primitive style of canning, because when we're pressure canning, or we, we take a food and we put it into a, um, a mason jar. All we're doing is two things. We're basically creating what's called a hermetic seal, which is a technical way of saying we're not allowing air into this into this vessel. While at the same time, we're raising it to such a temperature to kill any bacteria that could possibly live in there. And that's why there's different temperatures for pressure canning different types of foods, because you can kill all the bacteria in 
vegetables at a lot lower temperature as opposed to meats. Uh, but the basic premise of the, the fat over top of uh, a food is the fat is going to act as a layer to prevent the oxygen and the moisture and everything from penetrating to get to that food. Hence, the the inhibition of, of bacterial growth. Uh, with respect to beef jerky being sealed in mylar, I mean, this is this is one of those random questions. I was talking with one of my mentors, Doug, the other day, and we were saying about the conduction of water on your skin, right? And it's 25%. It's like, well, how do you know it's 25%? How do you know? We don't know. It's it's all... It's, there, it's, I've heard that for years in military numbers and stuff, that like wet clothing you, you're, is is coming off of your body at 25% faster than... What, is that what you're yeah, talking about? It, it's not... Here's my point, though. And he... Well, not my point. His point is it's not 25. You know, maybe it's... It, it, it's There's factors. It's your age, sure. your health. How much weight you have, blah 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 blah. So with yeah. this gentleman's question, how big's the meat? The bigger the meat, it's going to affect the longevity, uh, the temperature. We'll go back to the food storage cycle that I talked about: the humidity, temperature, sunlight, oxygen. You know, what are the factors that affect food storage? Let's break it down. Let's break down the science, yeah. right? So we can yeah. control those environments. So those those uh, characteristics, qualities, fat, fat, as JJ was saying. That's a care. That's something that inherently food will go bad if there's a fat content. That's the first thing that you said. We can yeah, remember. all those factors. It's funny that you mentioned that the factors of food storage because I just watched a video. I think it was the Provident Prepper channel. It's a fairly small channel, but they just did a video recently where they cracked open some food that was stored. It was some beans, I think, stored at the exact same time, the exact same way, and the only difference was one was in a basement. And one was in a garage and you could, it was visibly different. Like the ones that were in the garage were subjected to heat and, you know, wildly changing temperatures were much darker and like harder and more brittle. And the other stuff was basically fine. And then you add in the other factors, like you said, like moisture, oxygen, the actual food itself. You know, if you've got trying to jerk a five pound steak, it's probably not going to last as long as really thin strips that are completely dried all the way through. Exactly. So, a lot of factors. No, go on, go on. I'm just agreeing with you. That was, no, yeah, that was it. I'm just saying you're, you're right. It, it comes down to all the same factors that affect other so, long-term you know, food. The course. random question well, again for the temperature. Chat, the random question we're getting. If it was done properly, if it was sealed, um, small strips, I'd have no problem test, test, test tasting it after, you know, 20 years, I guess. Uh, if you want a, a logical response, uh, more, you know, I'm thinking more back with, with some of the edible talks that I've, that I've done and I've been a privy to with experts, you know, use some rationality about it, you know, open it up, smell it. Okay. Yeah, that's the, that's the best indicator of all right there is, is, there you know, go. I mean, that that's number one thing. Yeah. Smell it, you know, try and feel it. Uh, look at the color, you know, look at the, uh, is it, is it slimy? You know, scrape, that could be scrape the mold, scrape the mold back and see what color it is. Yeah. <laughs> is it green? Green is it good? So we started mentioning uh, ghee too, which is basically rendered butter as opposed to rendered fat. So that's another way of making it more stable. And it, it the when you just just to talk, talk about that a little bit here, when rendering fat, uh, all it all it really is is it's taking taking regular fat from an animal, literally scraping it from the animal. You put it into a pot. You heat it up, Boiling and out. what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to start to liquefy, and then you're going to have some solids left over. Those are the cracklings, basically, and you you just pull all that stuff out, and then the liquid that's left is your rendered fat. And so I, I think what happens is there's a little bit of a chemical process there that that goes on that kind of uh, um, you know makes it a little bit more of a pure substance or whatever the case may be, and that's why it'll last longer. Um, than opposed to just regular fat, you know what I mean? Like without rendering it down. So as far as finding it, survival theory said he has a hard time finding it. You can just make it yourself. I mean, I, I don't, I'm sure they do sell it. I'm sure somebody does sell it, but you can just make it. It's very easy to make. Or if you want to look around in a lot of the like um, ethnic markets, foreign markets, they use stuff like ghee and these, these things a lot more often than Americans do. So it might be a better place to look. Yeah. Well, look, don't look. Get into hunting because it's an invaluable skill and learn how to kill a deer there you and, go. It, and learn how to, how to deal with its fat. And it's, I've got fat, I've got deer fat in my freezer right now. Um, right, yeah. Go to the source. Go to the source. That's it. 
that's it. You know, if you want, if you want, if you want my advice, go right to the learn how to do it the way that we would do it. Yeah. And, and that's a good good point. Skittles mixed stabby pants. He said uh, the only thing you gotta the only thing you got I love that name. Um, you, the only thing you gotta worry about is not getting it too hot, and that is absolutely true. Um, you wanna you wanna keep it if you, if it's starting if it's smoking off a lot and everything like that, then you've got it too hot. You just want it to just as low a flame as possible to, to get it to melt is really what you're looking for. Exactly. All right. There you go. We're at about an hour and a half. You guys, how long, how much longer we want to push this on? Good. If we got any uh, last minute questions related to the sanitation topic, we can hit that. If not, we'll call today. Make sure you guys smash the like button. If you haven't already watched our videos on the top 10 sanitation concerns, they're on our channels, Reality Survival and Prepping, Prepper Logic, and this channel as well. So uh, next time, what do you want to guys talk a little bit about what we're doing for the next time, or you want to do that offline? It's up to you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm good with whatever. I mean, I, I think it needs to be easy. This this one's this one was way too hard. I need it easy, something easy. <laughs> Prefer, I, you know, I was thinking about I was thinking about following Che's thing and, and doing some yeah. You know, oh, prefer, prefer conflicted. You, what yeah, I did. That? I have. Well, I've been watching those. It's good. It's a, good to get the um the topic given to you too, and just be able to. <laughs> those are typically a lot shorter, but maybe we could do a couple of them or something. Hey. hey. So now see, I, I now you know you're not the only person. On you're not the only person on social media doing these, Jay. But I was, really? I was, I was going to reserve it because I was like, well, I don't know if I want to copy him because. That's right. Um, but the, guess what? I, Jay, I'm the one that started it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. You know, let me tell you the background on that because you guys have watched it, obviously. It's pretty cool. I got your, I got your, uh, your, your thing today. You know, I'm being as proud and superior that I am. I didn't respond to anything. But, you know, I read your what, what are you talking about? Well, your comment. You were like 12 gauge. That was me. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, not mine. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Yours, JJ. You or, talking, right? No, I don't think so. I said it would depend. I said there's so many variables. It depends on where you're at and where you're going and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Maybe I was thinking that. I said I would take the 12 gauge unless I was in an area where I was more likely to encounter an elk than a human, then I'd take the 308. But, for some reason, I was thinking JJ said the Tom Cage. Okay, no. Well, there's no uh, confusion between the two of you because they just completely ignore what Eric says. I don't care. I mean, I'm way better looking too. So I'm going to say because I was so young and JJ was just ancient over here. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but in, in all honesty, actually, I did. I for some reason I thought you said tall, but in respect to that, it came from a a very good friend of mine, a uh, martial artist that. Started this on Facebook. He says, "Hey, you want to do this?" And I thought, "Hey, well, you know, for shits and giggles, it's fun." And they're always they're, they're one time takes, and I read them. It's like on the spot. It's, it's sort of a, like a a real reaction. Um, sure. To the to the to the question, and I, I found them to be in like uncomfortable, like incomplete. Like you want more context with what yeah. the you know when. You know, with, with what you guys had responded with, it's just like it's here's the situation. You're on a highway, it's an EMP, blah, blah, blah. What do you do? You're like, okay, do you have a bug out location? How close are you to the bug out location? Um, do you have any weapons with you? Is your, is your family with you? So, no, I, I'm rolling that wave right now, mostly to do with time. People have been bugging the shit out of me for the, the dark prepper mindset concept. I've got a lot of those videos stacked up in my mind. I know it's a popular series, or even the Arguing are you a, are you a, are you a closet werewolf prepper, Che? Yeah. <laughs> Come on now. Maybe a little bit. The thing with <laughs> the thing with the AWSE or arguing with survival experts is I trash other preppers. Um, it's like it it either gives me a lot of uh, what's the word? People appreciate it or they hate me. And there's <laughs> yeah, one like, or the other. Yeah, there's a, there's a few preppers out there, and I'm not going to name names, but JJ and Eric, we know there's a few prepper channels out there on YouTube that are completely full of shit. <laughs> there's we, a lot of them. Uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> and it's why do like, you think, why like, think my channel is called Reality Survival, dude? Because yeah. so many people yeah. don't live in reality. They don't. They just so I'm on that sort of fence where, and there's there's one big one where I've got. It it's not, it's not like I want to attack the person. Like I have all, 
the, um, the respect for people that are into survival, they've got survival training, whatever, but there's, it's just so blatantly obvious that there's a scale. There's a scale between teaching people being passionate about survival skills or bushcraft skills or preparedness. And then there's, I want to take your fucking money, right? And here's the product. And they give me a bag of shit. And I'm going to wrap this up and make an amazing video and, and sell it to you. And I'm seeing too much of that. It's like, I don't know. I, I think we're going to see more of that soon, very soon, because I just don't care. Sure. You know. Here we got an important question. It says, who do you guys think would win in a three-way fight, Eric, Shea, or JJ? <laughs> that's, not even, that's not even a question. Well, I know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm glad you heard this <laughs> here. But the question that I think is, if this is a three-way free-for-all, I think um, Shea would do something weird while we're like jujitsu battling it out. But I also, I don't know if either. I'm, I'm pro, I, might, I might be the smallest guy in the group. I have no idea how. JJ, you just look like you're taller and bigger than I am. I'm, I might be a little bit tall. I'm, I'm six foot, about 260 pounds. So. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> I'm 5'10", 5'11", five, five, and I'm about 165 pounds. So yeah. you got a few pounds on me. Well, they, what do they say that 20 pounds is, is equivalent to one belt in jiu-jitsu? Yeah, right. So I'm, I'm, like a, I'm like a coral belt, you know? Right. <laughs> oh. I'm not that tall. <laughs> I'm under six foot. I'll say that much. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm about five ten. So, wow. I'm, you know, I've got my tricks. You got your trick. Yeah, there you go. Sorry, you're what? You're, you're what? We my had a, I've got my same that I was going to closed. Oh, go ahead. Like you might not know that I'm wearing my prepping diaper, and then it'll just squirt <laughs> out onto you in the grappling exchange, and then you you'll be totally discombobulated, <laughs> and that's when I make my move. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, too It's like, I got a crap. And Eric's <laughs> like, well, it's okay if I crap because I'm wearing my diaper. So I'm going to take you. <laughs> How did we get on that stuff? I don't All right. Know. So I want to go ahead and suggest that we uh, talk about our next topic offline since I don't think we have anything really prepared for the next well, day. For, for fun, why don't we uh, give the audience. How many people do we have online right now? Just so the was about 40 last I looked. Let me check. 59. Boom. All right. What are we giving two minutes to shout out topics? Yeah. You guys, All right. you guys have any uh, topic ideas? Can't guarantee that we're going to use them, especially if it involves diapers or nude sunbathing. We've already <laughs> discussed ad nauseum on this, but uh, definitely throw them in there. You know, something that we can talk for about, you know, 10 to 15, 20 minutes on, but nothing too incredibly broad because then it would require some multiple videos. But. <laughs> Yeah. Kelly Diggs, Kelly Diggs hit it on the nose. She says it probably depends on who can draw a weapon faster. <laughs> Usually does. That's what they say to like people like Wild Bill and stuff were actually not necessarily that good shots or that fast, but they were good at recognizing when things were turning. Yeah. And I'm gonna have to kill this guy. <laughs> yeah. And my best my best time for two shots is 0.4 seconds. I've never timed four. myself. From you was talking was about Draw like just standing there to drawing to. Yeah, two. that was during a class. That was during a class that I was having. Then that and that, 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 that was outside bad. waistband or concealed or what? Outside the waistband under a vest. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, you know, uh, you hit you run target at what distance? Uh, that was only at like seven yards, I think. Something it was close. Yeah, that's yeah. the average for self defense shooting. Seven yards. What's that? That makes the difference how far are you going? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right. Have we got any suggestions yet? Seven yards or twenty five yards? Yeah. Yeah. I think so said, like I said, a perfect tip is the average for self defense shootings. Uh, seven 20, yards. Twenty one feet, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, twenty one feet, seven yards. What was that, Eric? The twenty I heard that the average distance for self defense encounters yes. is about seven yards. Yeah, that's what or you're talking about the guy with the knife that if you're I, think less that's why, I think that's why they use that. But in most yeah. places, like that probably counts parking lot encounters by police and things. Because if you're indoors, it's going to be less than that. It takes a pretty big room for people to be more than, you know, 10 feet away from each other. I'm fairly certain the FBI came up with that statistic based, looking looking at officer involved shootings and coming up with the average of, right. of the different distances um, was was 21 feet. When I was so I would venture to say that for civilians, it's probably even shorter average. Yeah. A civilian host SHTF, especially because we're not going to be, you know, hey, can you uh, turn off the vehicle or, or anything of that? You know, in the court, oh, it's going to be. Get the fan, we're going to be sniping people from 1200 yards away. It's not even a concern. Exactly. 
<laughs> right. So what, what do we got here? To think. Unusual prepping finds after SHTF. Caffeine supplements. It's How about you you're talking your wife into prepping? I did. Uh, well, I did the five five reasons or, to, or five ways to get your spouse on board with prepping once. All right, check out that video. What were they? Give it. Give it to us. First one was duct um, tape and uh, <laughs> strong pimp hand. <laughs> I just it just basically talks about the benefits of prepping and you know as like food insurance and and all those kinds of things. I mean, it was it was pretty pretty basic, but I think it hit all the all the major high points. Um, how to bug in or bug out with small children? Might not be. No, I don't really have a lot of experience. I know I watch uh, Rogue Preparedness does videos about prepping with kids. She has a uh, kid. Here, now this this might be good. See what you guys think. Uh, topic of how to judge people to let in your bug out group. That's interesting. Like, what criteria or questions would you how have? Would you people. How would you vet people for your community? That's a that's a contender. <laughs> how to change how to change survival diapers and SHTF. <laughs> Well, that's all you, uh, JJ, because, you know, me and Eric, <laughs> Not me. that's all your department there, buddy. Yeah, you can cover that one. You can cover, you can go solo, uh, <laughs> live stream on your own there, buddy. <laughs> that's um, not bad. I, I know Harvey, too. He's a nice guy. He's probably, his face is probably lighting up right now. He was at an event with me, uh, Last week we did a bit of a hike, bug out hike. And I just told, I, I said to everybody, you know, bring your stoves and whatnot. And he brought a he brought a stove from IKEA. It wasn't a stove. IKEA doesn't make fucking stoves, but he brought like a utensil holder. And his buddy had, had like cut out a section of it, like a rectangle, and it was like a makeshift a makeshift stove. And he he sends me emails all the time. I got one today, I think. So Harvey, slow down on the fucking emails, please. But <laughs> it's actually not a bad topic. What was it? No, that's not bad. And here's another decent one too. Anthony Jensen says, "What would you do about family or friends who are basically moochers or leeches in a shit the fan scenario? Like you can't exactly just boot them because they're family." Moochers yeah. or leeches now in a shit shit the fan scenario. So okay, people right. who are refusing to prep. Do they know if you're a prepper or not? And this is the big issue with. People in our position, if, and I know JJ has a different view on this. If they know you're a prepper, they're going to come to you when shit hits the fan. Right. Come on. Come on. <laughs> For you. Yeah. And we talk about I think we've kind of covered that one in some of the last. Some sure. Of the last, yeah, yeah. Keep it going, Eric. What's next? What else do we got? Um, that's pretty much the only other topic recommendations. How do you tell family members no? Different variation of the same one, basically. Some people want us to watch the colony and discuss the survival skills. We could do that. Like, well, I've been doing the movie reviews. We could pick a movie. That might be a, that might be a good, good thing watch to do. The same one and then do our take on it. You know why they, they uh, canceled that? That was an interesting show. The Colony? Have you guys seen it? You guys seen it? There, there was two. There was a movie called The Colony, and then there was a series, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Completely different. The series. I did see the movie. You haven't seen the TV show? No, but I could watch it. Maybe. Two seasons. Maybe Eric can can help me elaborate on this. I haven't seen that actually. Oh really? Okay. No, it's one I've missed. Okay, so Discovery history. I don't know, uh, but basically they had there was two seasons, and they had they put eight people or a dozen people. Oh, was this more like a reality show? Yes, I did see the first season of that one. Okay, what do you recall from it? I remember there was a guy who got like left at the end and there was some chick who was supposed to be like martial arts expert and was uh supposedly kicked the ass of some guy who was like six five looked like a rock basically and i was like this is a load of horse shit okay but other than that there were some interesting things the one that was there was an impressive guy on there assuming it was all you know legitimate and not all staged who did a lot of really uh good you know mechanical engineering type stuff to come up with solutions for yeah. you know like water ionization he was doing to purify the water some pretty cool stuff like that so it was interesting. What do, you, what do you think about let's let's pick a movie, a survival movie or something? And yeah, I like that. We'll pick a we movie, even, we'll watch it. We then. could even bring in some clips. Like we could get clips, you know, and 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 do a screen share and and show like what parts we're talking about. It might be a little more complex, but I think I think we could probably make it work. Yeah, I think so. What do you think, Che? 
Sure. I mean, it, I, I'm not going to expect you to watch, you know, a series or two of. Uh, well, let's just do a movie instead of a series. Yeah, we'll do like the road. Yes, or... I'll, I'll, I'll conclude it this way. It was, it was a very interesting. If you do get the time to watch it, I found it interesting. The dynamic, although television for the most part, where survival is concerned, is pretty much fake. But they didn't go to number three season because somebody actually died on the set of no the call. Yeah, it was kind of fucked up because I was like kind of into it because it was it was like the preparedness thing. They weren't in the woods. They were like in warehouses. And right. They had to figure out how to make a, a shower and, and gather food and blah, blah, blah. Sure. Movie. So what? what JJ, give it to me. What are you thinking? Movie. So what? one of the suggestions here is American Blackout. The other one is How It Ends. I've already done um, the review on How It Ends, I think. How about American Blackout? Okay. I've seen it a long time ago, but it's 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 been a while, so I I could I could rewatch that one and do so that. So what's what's the purpose though? Like I've seen them both. Do you want to see? So them? I think basically we just we we kind of watch it and then we just make some notes, kind of kind of uh, points on like learning points or laugh at them because they're stupid points, you know. And then we'll just come back together and compile our lists and just talk about the movie. Yeah, you just do lessons learned, things the characters did right or did wrong, what you would do in a similar situation, things like that. Okay, so American Blackout, I remember that being more documentary style, and they had like a fictitious family going A, B, C, D, E, F, G. How it ends, I've definitely seen it. Can you? Would you mind just going through the, the narration of what it was? That was, that was the basic Netflix one where, yeah, the guy oh, has to okay. travel. Okay. From like, oh, they got to travel across yeah. Yeah, Forest yeah. Whitaker. Well, if that's the case, I think American Blackout would be better because it's more I of an so. standpoint as opposed or, to the other one. The other one is Postman uh, with Kevin Costner. People, some people suggested that one. That's less realistic. I, I like the ones that yeah. include the beginning stages because that's the way you see the most kind of realistic stuff happen. Yeah, and the Postman is. It'll take us from now until the next chat to watch it because it's like eighteen hours long. Too, it so. is really long. <laughs> Did you guys find that girl hot? In that movie, in the Postman, yeah, man, it's been so many years since I'd yeah, seen. I don't I know know remember in, which which was, one. I know she was in something else, but I don't remember what else she was in. She killed the horse. That's how I remember. Oh yeah, yeah, and that, was, that was hot to me. That got you. <laughs> that got you aroused. Killing the animals, <laughs> rendering the yeah. pet. One yeah, thousand. One yeah. thousand. Baby, go. If I'm sick in the hut. Yeah, you know, I got a girl here that's gonna kill the horse. I just remember yeah. that stuck in. Um, so there's actually two versions of uh, of Blackout. America, well, maybe it's called UK Blackout or something like that. But there's there's a UK version of it, American mm -hmm. Blackout, and well, we can discuss that. But if we want to do that, sure. Well, we ought to we ought to let the people know now which one, so that we so they, they can watch it too. Okay. Like we actually listen to their opinion and care. I mean, okay. <laughs> we'll tell them. We'll tell them. <laughs> yes. Let's just go with them. I, I, I think the American Blackout's on YouTube and Netflix too, right? Yeah. Okay. So the, original, the original. I, I watched oh, that. You know, I, somebody just came up with one. I, I think. I think we should. I vote for a change. Red Dawn. The, Red the Dawn is, ama is amazing. The Hold, on. The, Hold on. Hold on. Not okay. the first one. Not the first yeah, one. But dude. The Dude, what are you drinking? Because it says there's the first, the second, but this guy's saying the Korean version. What the fuck well, that, is that? They were the fighting second. Koreans, and the, that's the yeah, the oh, Koreans were the ones. They were fighting Koreans. So I don't like that. I don't like that at all. 2012 update. The, the original one is much much better. So I have a theory. I have a theory about Red Dawn the movie. Okay. And and I I think that Red Dawn the movie might perhaps be responsible for more people becoming preppers than any other single thing. Interesting. It's perhaps, perhaps true because that, that movie when when we people our age, right? Like these, these, you know, thirties to fifties or whatever, that movie was, you know, a popular movie and, and a lot of people saw it. And I, 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 I really think that it influenced people on a subconscious level. To, to where they, they don't even really know that that was what caused them to do it. But I know for me, it had an impact on me. So and you're I, a Wolverine think, prepper instead of a werewolf prepper. That's right. Well, I, th I think we have the, uh, the werewolf prepper here. We don't know what the definition is. <laughs> uh, okay. 
All right, that's you know, all. Uh, the um, the new one was supposed to be the Chinese originally, yeah. but they got so much pushback about not being able to show the movie in Asia and whatever that they switched it to be North Koreans, which yeah. obviously is ridiculous that the North Koreans would invade mainland <laughs> the U.S. The yeah, North America. Korean Navy. <laughs> The North Korean uh, Navy is made of plywood boats. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's completely ridiculous. They don't even have enough people anyway. It doesn't. They, they can't get to Japan, let alone the United States. Right. So it was hilariously absurd for that reason. But it was originally written to be the Chinese, which makes more sense. Yeah. So, what do you guys think? Would you rather do this the second uh, Red Dawn, the, the newest version of it, or would you rather go with American Blackout? My vote is the original Red Dawn or American Blackout. I'm not interested in the new one. Oh, okay. All right. Neutral. Okay. So it comes back to me. Yeah. Whatever you think. I break it. You, whatever you think, man. Jeez, I don't know. You, you kind of fucked me up with that, that whole subconscious story about people. <laughs> Telling you, man. I don't. I can't say. If you, saw that movie, if you saw that movie when you were a teenager, I'll bet you're a prepper. I'm just saying. <laughs> maybe. 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 I was actually born that when that movie, the year that movie came out. So, I do know the American, not Canadian. The Americans will change the nature of their advertising to recruits, Air Force, Army, uh, Navy, based on how much they need at the time. They will actually. It's almost like this. It's almost like a string or an elastic band. It, so, it wouldn't surprise me. If, if the uh, the American government will say implemented certain strategies to inadvertently subconsciously invoke certain characteristics within their population, there you go. There's your logic. I think you're giving them way too much credit, man. This movie means preparedness. That's like yeah. me saying, uh, you know, uh, hey, uh, you know, driving Miss Daisy equals better drivers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the chat seems to be fairly unanimous in favor of Red Dawn, so let's do that one. The original Red Dawn. No, no, no. hold on. Proper logic. Shay. One, two, three. Okay, fine. Forget it. I was just joking. Sure. They want to do that? That's all good. We'll do it. Let's do all it. All right. So we're going the original, the original Red Dawn. The original, original Red Dawn. Dawn prepping and preparedness lessons that you can learn from it and things that you would do differently, things the characters did right or did wrong, things like that. Very cool. I think we this is going to be fun. I think this will, this will be good because the last topics were all serious and shit. Right, this, this, one, this one will be a nice little break. That'll be kind of cool. So we, just to clarify one more time, we're going to all go, we're all going to watch Red Dawn. We're going to provide our top ten on not even a top ten, just just less just smart. Note. Yeah, nope. just notes, lessons learned, critiques, uh, you know, jokes about it, laughing about it, little clips that you want to show. Because when you when you pull up in here when we're in this chat, we we should be able to go to a screen share. You, if you click on the screen, there's I a little. I see it over here. I don't know what I have on my tab, so I'm not going to do it right now. <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you figure spend some time figuring that out, and then you can have little clips loaded up in your in your window, and you can you can play it, and it's kind of kind of fun. You know what I mean? Like it's it's kind of I think it would be kind of cool. Okay. Yeah, but, I agree. That'll be the plan. So we'll do um, two weeks from now. Yeah. Well, Carly Hill was asking, uh, when is it happening? Where, where is it going to happen? I guess would be the next question. Well, let's do, well, you want to do uh, Eric's channel for three weeks? We did mine for three, right? Okay. We'll Eric for three and then yours for three? Sure. Does Sounds that work? good. So it'll be my channel here again in two weeks from today, which should be the 24th. 24th of February. February. At the okay. same time. 5 p.m. Pacific, and we will discuss PM the Mountain and fending off communist invaders. <laughs> we will discuss Red Dawn and the dominance. Very good. Exactly. Very good. Patrick Swayze at his best. That was the height of his career right there. Pretty yeah. much. Definitely Charlie Sheen, too. And you got a bunch of people in there. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of an all star cast. Sorry, yeah. JJ, it was Charlie Sheen, but who did you think it was? Patrick Swayze? Patrick, Patrick Swayze. Oh, they play brothers in the movie. Yeah. No. Roadhouse. I mean, that was his biggest, I think. Yeah, I think. you're right. You're right. All right. Or Dirty Dancing. I mean, you know. That was good, too. That was yeah. not not Red Dawn, though. But, uh, Nobody puts baby in the corner. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to tell you, JJ. Well, we set a, a record today for time. I think we've gone about almost two hours. So, Damn. 
I'm going to call it. Thanks for, thanks for sticking with us, folks. That's yeah, thanks for watching. Don't, don't forget back. to click the thumbs up and don't forget to share and all that kind of stuff. We appreciate exactly. it. Come back in two weeks and check out uh, JJ's channel, Reality Survival, and Che's channel, Prepper Logic. And if you're not subscribed to all three of ours, do that. It's the best way to stay in uh, on top of these uh, trifecta collaborations that we're doing. So thanks for watching, guys, and I will talk to you later. Yeah.